Welcome to That's What She Said About the Bible, a podcast by Wycliffe College. That's What She Said is a podcast devoted to telling the stories of historical women who taught others about the Bible from the pulpit and from the page. What did they write? What did they say? And why have we never heard of many of them? Join your hosts, Dr. Marion Taylor and Kira Molman, as they dig up the words of these forgotten women and explore their lives, their influences, and their relevance for today. For more information and episodes, visit our website at www.wickliffcollege.ca slash podcast. So who was Josephine Butler? Where did she live? What was her, what was her family like? Josephine Butler was born in 1828 in England, and she was born into a family that had very strong ties to politics. Her father was an abolitionist. Her uncle was uh, the um, prime minister at one point. So she lived in a home where around the dinner table you talked about politics. And unlike most families where when that happened, the men sort of asked the women and the daughters to leave so the men could talk about real manly things. But in the Butler household, you stayed. Well, actually, it's the Gray household, you stayed. Um, So she was trained to think that she could have opinions about what was going on in politics and that she could learn to argue and express her opinions about those issues and that what she thought was worth listening to. So that was a very unique family to grow up in. And later on in her life, all her training around the table becomes very important because she was confident, she was articulate, she was strong in what she believed, and she had great convictions. So it was a family that were, the family was, was involved in politics, but they were also a very, uh, a family that was a Christian family. And it was a, they were Anglicans, but she had other people in her life that were in other denominations. So she had Methodism in her background and experience. So she was exposed to a wide variety of other denominations. And uh, so she was brought up in a, in a home where faith made a difference. And faith wasn't bound by one particular denomination. No, not at all. Nope. So I think her family, um, her family background in terms of the family of origin, but also her faith are the two biggest factors that influence her growing up. So um, later on, she talked about uh, her dissatisfaction with the church. And when she was 17, she was out riding a horse and came across a body of a person who had committed suicide. And that was a deeply disturbing experience. And she later writes in her memoirs of her dark night of the soul during her peri- during this period of her life, where she was questioning a lot of things. She was wondering, what should I do with my life? She didn't just want to get married and have children. She wanted to serve God. She was also frustrated with the church as she experienced it. And she thought, she criticized the, the minister who, she said, he was doing the best job he could, but that wasn't enough for her. So what happened then was that she fostered her own relationship with God. And she talked about it, having a personal relationship of, with God that we would describe as quite mystical. And she uh, spent time with God in prayer. She spoke to God and she expected that she would hear from God. And she studied scripture. So she was a very devout Christian uh, who was, whose faith really stood behind everything that she would later do. It's interesting that um, in terms of her calling, she would later talk about being having a prophetic kind of call. And uh, I think that, that also gave her a sense of authority that she was called by God to do certain things, and that gave her permission to go out and do what she felt she was called to do. That's, that's her early childhood, and um, I think that... Uh, leading up to her marriage. This was an important um, background. And in uh, 1850, so when she was, what is that, 22, she met uh, George Butler, a man who became her husband. 
Uh, he was a fellow at Oxford, and he was studying. Uh, he had studied theology. They fell madly in love. And their marriage was not a typical Victorian marriage. Often they were contractual arrangements between families and often uh, issues of wealth and inheritance was part of the deal. But Josephine and George were kindred spirits and they really loved each other. And they both were very committed to a marriage where the men, the husband and the wife were equal partners. And he fully supported Josephine in all her endeavors. Even as, even while they were engaged, she was very involved with some of the social movements in terms of uh, equality for women. Uh, the suffragists were beginning to advocate for women's having the right to vote. But there were also other issues, like women at the time, once you got married, your inheritance went to your husband, and the land that you would have been could have inherited was no longer yours. So that was seemed to be, that was not seemed to be a, a, a law that was just for women. So she was involved in that. And she was involved in uh, really pushing for women's rights to have higher education because at the time women weren't allowed to go to university. So she was, she was compelled to fight for, to fight against the laws of the land when they were not just when it came to women. And he supported her all the time. Like he, and he, later on in, in her career, in his career, as things heated up and she got more and more involved in politics, it, people thought that was not a favorable thing in terms of his career. And he, uh, he suffered for that, but he was willing to do that because he, he thought that cause was just. So they had three children. Uh, three little boys were born at Oxford, and then uh, they had one daughter, Eva. But during this period, it wasn't an easy time for Josephine to live at Oxford. She would have dinner around the table with the theologues, you know, all these single men who talked theology. But she also picked up on their attitudes toward women. And uh, uh, certain novels had come out that portrayed women in a negative light, that a woman who was um, became pregnant after an affair, the blame was on her and not the man. And she thought, this isn't right. But she decided that she looked around the table and all these men seemed to agree that, you know, it's the woman's fault. And so she kept silent at that point. So being at Oxford was not a happy place for her. Uh, she also um, was involved, she got to know some of these uh, scholars, and later on she will have a, um, a correspondence with a very famous professor, Benjamin Jowett. So Benjamin Jowett was the Regis Professor at Oxford of Greek, and he was involved in um, an essay on the interpretation of scripture, which was very important and is continues to be important in articulating a change in how Christians or how Christian scholars are reading the Bible. So they are advocating reading the Bible like any other book. So that means it, it changes in its nature in terms of being a divine book to being a human book. Butler was not happy about that, and she, she will later write. She and Jowett have a correspondence, and, um, and they, they disagree on whether, you know, how women interpret the Bible versus how men interpret the Bible. So her health wasn't great. She had some chest infection, and the doctor said, well, being in Oxford uh, wasn't the greatest place for them to live, so they moved to Bristol. And it's at Bristol where her daughter, Eva, who's now her youngest child, um, she was born when she was 31, uh, her, she went out, the parents went out for an evening, and Josephine came home. Her daughter was on the balcony or up on the up the stairs on the second floor, so excited to see her mom come home. And she's saying, oh, mom, you know, you're home. And she leans over the banister and falls to her death. And her parents watch her. They hear her screams. And then she said no, like she was silent. And that experience, of course, changed their lives. And Josephine Butler never got over that experience. And she didn't even want to talk about it. And, but apparently over the next 
dec few decades, she began to write about it in her letters and in her other writings. So that is the, the game-changing event of Butler's life. She was so brokenhearted that she felt that she should go and work with people who were more broken than she was. So at this point, um, there were a lot of options because they were in Liverpool. And one of her relatives actually said, why don't you go to the workhouse where there's this workhouse that have 5,000 people there. And in the cellar were all these women who were virtually in prison. And many of them had been prostitutes and were now incarcerated. And Josephine decided that she would do that. When she got to this workhouse, she said, I would like to go down and work with the women. And they refused, the, the, the um, people who worked there refused to go with her to accompany her down to the cellars because the pre previously one of them had gone down, a woman had gone down and had been violently beaten. So they said, no, we're not going. You can go on your own. So she did. So you hear, have an elegant woman well-educated, highly articulate, going down into the cellar with prisoners. Um, and what the women were doing in the basement was called um, oakum. They, they take a rope that had been covered in tar, and they had to pick the tar off the rope, and then the rope would be recycled. So all day long, this is what the women did. So Josephine Butler sat with these women in the cellar and picked uh, off the tar from the ropes. And it, it's an interesting picture, right? You, so you see all these women and you see Josephine Butler picking the tar. And they, trust, they learned to trust her. And she, they asked her questions. She asked them questions. So this is where Josephine Butler began to understand the plight of prostitutes and other and women who were marginalized who did who got into prostitution because they had no other option and they also began to understand who Josephine Butler was because she said I am a broken woman just like you are and I and so they trusted her and over time she shared scripture with them and she prayed with them so even after the first day when she met one of the women who was dying, she said, she asked if she could bring that woman to her home to die in a different place uh, rather than this cold, damp, horrible workhouse where you had no privacy. And so she did. So the next day in her carriage, she brought the carriage to this workhouse and they took this woman home to die. And this was not the first woman that this happened to. I think you've read about this too, Carol. It wasn't the first or the last, I guess. That's right. right. So right. she, and it's, it's exciting too because George was so supportive of this. So she goes home and says, I'm going to bring this lady home if, if you're okay with that. He says, great, bring around the carriage. Right. And they end up taking so many people in that they don't have space anymore. And so they start building other homes and kind of facilitating billets almost with right. other people so that other people who are sick and dying in these workhouses will be able to die well. Yeah, and she also um, initiated little businesses for these women, right? right? That uh, she thought if they don't go back to be prostitutes, what can they do? And so she had an envelope business is one of the things that she did. So. This is pretty advanced thinking. This is something she did all on her own, out of their own resources, and because she learned, she loved these women, and she so she identified with them as real women. She and and that is so countercultural because she was a woman who was brought up in a class of English society that would not even know about prostitutes. They wouldn't even want to talk about prostitutes. But here she is. Uh, bringing them into her home. And of course, this raised many eyebrows. And uh, But this is who this woman, Josephine Butler, is. Later on in her life, they ask her to come on board to fight against this law where um, 
in any military town, women can be, if they are accused of prostitution, they will be taken to the police and they would be inspected for venereal disease because uh, the rate of syphilis was so high in these towns. No one seemed to think that maybe they should also check if the men had syphilis. So the women are getting all of the blame for this. And if they refuse to be checked for this disease, they can be put into prison. So some people come to her and ask if, they, if she could help fight against this law or this bill. Um, and they, this group, they call it steel or surgical rape. This type of examination it was uh, very forceful and invasive. And any man could accuse any woman of prostitution and she would be forced to go through this process or face the potential of going to jail. So the, the people who were fighting against this saw this as very unjust and discriminatory towards women. Um, and Josephine Butler actually received testimonies from women who had worked in the sex trade who told her about how, or women who had been accused of this, and they told her about how damaging and painful and scary this process was. And the medical people that worked for the police, they didn't think they had to be gentle or kind because these were women that we're sleeping with somebody every night, so what would this be? This wouldn't be invasive for them. So Josephine really wrestles with whether or not she should do this. Um, and she says that she knows that this is a work of darkness, but she's worried about being called to oppose it. And so she actually refers to herself as a bit of a Jonah. She's hiding from this call. But then she thinks maybe this is part of what she's been praying about as a young person, even that God would use her for something big like this, and maybe this is the moment. But she's so worried that it's going to fill her up with anger and hatred, and how can she be a good Christian when she's just going to be angry and hateful and eventually starts to think maybe this is what I need to do. So then she starts to travel. Yeah, and so this is the first law came out in 1869. And uh, so she's aware of the Contagious Disease Act. And then uh, there was another one. Well, I guess that it's 1869. She became aware of the Contagious Disease Act. And the first one had come out in 1864. But because they didn't like to talk about prostitution, they apparently passed these laws in the middle of the night and didn't publicize them. So you have one in 1864, another one in 66, and then in 69. And their intention was to regulate prostitution, right, in these towns where there were soldiers. And apparently uh, up to a third of the soldiers had syphilis. But they, they blamed it all on the women and not the men. So she did get angry, and as, as she had already worked with women and women prostitutes, she knew who they were and what their lives were like, and so she just was outraged by this double standard. So she did agree to head up the Women's National Committee, I think it's called, and, uh, and they, she got, had other women and men working with her, but the women... Um, they planned, they, they sat, they had to sit down and plan what they were going to do. So they decided that they needed to speak to people in places in England and Ireland where the vote was very tight and that they could influence the voting public because women couldn't vote. So they had to influence the men who could vote to vote against the contagious diseases laws. So they they did that. And in one year, she traveled 3,700 miles and spoke in barns, in lecture halls, in churches. And she was not viewed as a friendly person. She was a very beautiful, a strikingly beautiful woman. 
and people are thinking, what is this woman doing talking about sex in a public place? And she actually identifies herself as, she doesn't say that she's a prostitute, but she kind of, she doesn't shy away from identifying with these women. No, no, that's right. Like, even like she's very spiritual, right? And called of God and knows the Bible, but she's not prudish at all, right? And she talks very openly about things that women shouldn't talk about in this period. So so part on, on her travels, her travels were tremendously difficult. Uh, people in one town, they had put up wanted posters so that would try, you know, watch out for this woman and don't be nice to her when she comes. And so she had to dress up in, in clothing that was not her own to hide her identity, right? And in another one, they heard that she was meeting in the top of a barn, and they set the straw on fire to smoke them out. Uh, so she, she just had a terrible time, and uh, it took a toll on her health and really m her mental health. Well, it makes sense. It makes total sense, yeah. right? I have this quote that says, there were gains hired by brothel owners that hounded her from one hotel to another and attacked them. They menaced her person. They chased her through the streets. Then they did the hayloft fire. And she was beaten to a pulp at one point when her bodyguards ran away. So she was a woman of courage <laughs> and faith. But during this period, um, she also found great inspiration in in the figure of Catherine of Siena, who was a, a woman from the 1400s, so 500 years earlier. And Butler was a very intelligent, well-read person. She read Italian, French, and Latin. And the sources for writing a biography on Catherine of Siena, which she did, uh, she had to translate these documents. And she produced a biography of Catherine of Siena a Catholic mystic that was 386 pages that was a bestseller. And it went through three editions. And here she is, a Protestant woman, writing about a Catholic saint. Well, I think you ha we both read an article on this. Uh, it was a scholar, Janet Larson, writes an article on, on Butler's biography of Catherine of Siena. And it's, a, it's an amazing article that talks about how Catherine became for Josephine Butler a historical sister. They had so much in common, right? They were women who worked with the poor, who worked with the marginalized, who worked with those who were diseased. And they were both women who got involved in politics and fight and, and had to fight against the institutions and the church when they were, the, the church was, and the leaders of the church were doing things they thought were wrong. So they were very courageous public figures. And so as she was researching Catherine of Siena, like I think it gave her inspiration to keep going. Yeah, in all of this chaos of travel and campaigning, this was a way for her to come back and kind of almost as a devotional be working on all of this. She also found, um, like Catherine was, had a very intimate relationship with Jesus, I would say. Um, and so she found a, a, a sisterhood in that way too, because Josephine too felt she could talk to God about anything. So Catherine became for her a model of communion with God in prayer. And Catherine prayed hours of every day, like she was a very spiritual person. But then not just was prayer the model, but also the outward career of resistance was the model. So I just think it's like, I like to talk about mentors being and finding a, the importance of finding a mentor in your life. And in my own life, I found in researching the stories of forgotten women, I found many dead mentors. And so I really, my in my own life, I resonate with Butler's excitement about finding a soulmate in Catherine of Siena. But there are points of disconnect, right? Right. Well, one of them is a Catholic mystic and the other is a Protestant. And something that struck me reading that Carson article 
or sorry, Larson article, how careful she is, Josephine Butler is, in presenting this Catholic mystic to a largely Protestant audience. Mm -hmm. And so, in a way, what she's doing is also a work of kind of ecumenical apologetics because she is saying this is someone that we can look to as an example of faith, even in a time where Catholics and Protestants don't necessarily talk to each other that much. And that's a theme throughout her life, even as a young person, having these different people part of her life. She does say, um, Larson writes that um, Butler's Catherine is a bold light bearer whose torch women must pick up in compassion and political work in solidarity with the poor, the chief victims of the acts. So there's the double focus of her life, right. like prayer, co contemplative prayer and a mystical relationship with God, but also action. Right. And, and I think that's an, um, you know, it's, a, it's a, a really important pairing that we see in the lives of many um, women and men in this period and in other periods. So I think her, um, you know, in, in writing this, uh, she, she says, um, well, she can, she, her work, Butler thinks her work uh, as a woman continues the work of the Reformation. In her recollections later in life, um, Butler did talk about, she wrote about her struggles, and um, we have that. Do you want to read that from her recollection? When she's trying to contemplate whether or not she's going to enter into this battle against what she sees as unjust legislation. She writes, I have not yet put on my armor, nor am I yet ready. Nothing so wears me out body and soul as anger, fruitless anger. And this thing fills me with such an anger and even hatred that I fear to face it. She goes on to talk about how this hatred and anger actually is making it difficult for her to pray and she's not sure how to be angry without sinning. But then she kind of works through, there is a way of having a righteous zeal. And that's something that comes up in scripture. And so she prays that God would actually help her fight injustice with this kind of zeal that's still coupled with divine compassion. And that's what ends up, I think, pushing her throughout all of the social reform that she's doing and all of the things that hinder her from doing that. What was really interesting to me when I first found Josephine Butler as an example of a woman interpreter of the Bible was the fact that she, in her speaking, uh, which was often like preaching, she did exposition of the Bible. So Victorians in England knew the Bible, so whether you were a church person or not, people referenced the Bible in their speaking and assumed you would know the know the stories behind the, the allusions. And one of the stories that she uses throughout her long career is one that most people today have no idea is in the Bible because it would be a what we would call a text of terror. It's the story that is found at the end of the book of Judges, and it's the story of the Levite's concubine. So if you haven't heard or read this story for a long time, I'll just quickly summarize it. Um, and it is, a, it is, as I said, one of the most horrible stories in the Bible in terms of the abuse of a woman, and uh, a story that escalates actually into tribal warfare and a lot of killing and it, it so it, it's at the end of the book of judges and so it's a book that things get worse and worse and worse and the refrain of the book of judges is and there was no king in the land um, things are getting worse like the, the that's actually the very conclusion of the book in those days there was no king in israel and all the people did what was right in their own eyes so this story is actually included as an example of how people did right in their own eyes. 
and to show how far people had sunk in, into that. So it is a story um, that talks about a, a Levite who uh, lives in the remote parts of the hill country of Ephraim. And he, he marries a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. But then something happens in their relationship, and it's not quite clear. This I'm reading from the New Revised Standard, which says, but his concubine became angry with him. And the footnote says, uh, she prostituted herself against him. So in any case, she leaves the marriage and goes to her father's house. After a little while, the husband goes to the father's house to bring back his concubine. And uh, when he's at the father's house, the father's very pleased that he's there. And he uh, wines and dines him for days. And he says, I need to go. No, no, stay another day. I need to go. And th this went on and on. And on the fifth day, the, he got up in early in the morning. This is the Levite, the husband. And he said to the father, fortify yourself. So they drink and eat some more. And by the end of the day, he said, no, really, I'm going. So they leave to go home late in the day. And uh, they, the father says, that's not a good time to leave. But anyway, he says, no, we're going. And so they did that. And they ended up in, um, in a, a place um, in Gibeah, in the open square of the town at night. And hospitality wasn't forthcoming. And a, an old man came from the field and said, well, you can come to my house. You're, I will feed your animals and I will give you, I will exercise hospitality. So that's what they did. What happens though in that home uh, is a very dark story. Um, so we reading in uh, chapter 19 of the book of Judges at this 22nd verse. While they were enjoying themselves, the men of the city, a perverse lot, surrounded the house and started pounding on the door. They said to the old man, the master of the house, bring out the man who came into your house so that we might have intercourse with him. And the man, the master of the house, went out to them and he said, no, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Since this man is my guest, do not do this vile thing. Here are my virgin daughter and his concubine. Let me bring them out to you now. Ravish them and do whatever you want to them. But against this man, do not do so vile a thing. But the men would not listen to him. So the man, the, the Levite, seized his concubine, put her out to them. They wantonly raped her and abused her all through the night until the morning. And as the dawn began to break, they let her go. As the morning appeared, the woman came and fell down at the door of the man's house where her master was until it was light. The next scene is in the morning. In the morning, her master got up, opened the doors of the house, and when he came out to go on his way, there was his concubine laying at the door of the house with her hands on the threshold. Get up, he said to her, we are going. But there was no answer. Then he put her on the donkey and the man set out for his home. When he'd entered his house, he took a knife and grasping his concubine, he cut her into 12 pieces, limb by limb, and sent her throughout all the territory of Israel. Then he commanded the men whom he sent, saying, Thus shall you say to all the Israelites, Has such a thing ever happened since the day that the Israelites came up from the land of Egypt until this day? Consider it, take counsel, and speak out. So these body parts he meant to have incite a war against the Benjaminites, where where Gibeah was and in, in retaliation for what they had done. So this is a horrible story, but Josephine Butler spoke about this story publicly many times over a 30 year period. And you think, why would she do this, right? What relationship does this story have from, the, from ancient Israel to England in the 19th century? She talks about well, I, I've often 
since I found this work by Butler, I get my students to read this. And I think you remember reading it. As I remember, intro- yeah, I remember where I was when I first read Josephine Butler's interpretation. And I think she says at the beginning of her interpretation, I've never heard a sermon on this passage. That's right. Which I don't think I have either. No, I've never heard a <laughs> sermon on this passage either. It's It's just a horrible story. And I looked up I tried to find other 19th century women who commented on these on this text, and most of them said, it's a horrible story. Or uh, one of them says, um, actually Mary Cornwallis in her commentary says, the men shouldn't have sent out the woman. They should have protected the woman and done whatever they could to barricade the house. Like she said, this is not right. And it, that's exactly what Butler thought. This is not right. Butler preaches, I would say preaches on this text in 1870, and uh, she, she interprets the story um, as a mirror, and all of scripture, as a mirror to, to life today. And she sort of, the, there's no, the horizons of the ancient text and the modern life blend together. So when she sees um, this woman, who she would say was a prostitute, she sees the prostitutes she has worked with. And when she sees how the, how the husband sends his wife out and doesn't listen to her cries on the other side of the door, she sees a parallel to what English women and men are doing and their attitudes toward prostitutes. So she, she has some pretty um, cutting things to say about uh, as, as she unpacks the story, it's a very powerful retelling. Uh, she she calls this story one of the many tragical history. Uh, we wouldn't call we would say many one of the many tragic histories recorded in the Old Testament, which she says is a true mirror of the faith and the righteousness, but also of the depravity of humans. And um, so she says. What my commentary is like, it's a prophetical commentary on life in the 19th century. So this is what she says to a a large crowd of 400 women in 1870. She rehearses the details of what she calls the ghastly story of what she calls the clamoring of the sons of Belial round the door, the suspense, the parley, till in the cowardice of self-defense the man brings out that helpless woman and casts her among the hellish horrors of that awful night. So you can imagine what these 400 women are thinking. They they probably haven't heard that story in a long time or read it, although they're very, maybe they have, maybe they read their Bible um, regularly. However, um, they wouldn't have heard this in that way. And so using the text as a mirror, she dramatically says, There is a weak and prostrate figure lying at our door. To this door she turns for help, though it be her dying fall. Her hands are on the threshold. So all those details in the text about the woman's hands are on the threshold, she calls them dead hands flung forward in mute and terrible appeal to the God above, who, looking down from heaven, sees not that prostrate form alone, but on the one side the powers of hell, and on the other, in their safe dwelling place, the selfish sleepers to whom the pale, cold hands appeal in vain. So she's put herself into the story and imagined what it was like for this woman with her hands flung to the door saying, help me, help me, and they, everyone's in, in the house sleeping. So she's saying to the audience, you women are on the inside of the house, ignoring the plight of the prostitute uh, who's crying for help. And how do you, so she needed to help, needed to get the audience to empathize with the plight of the woman And she does that by going to the stories in the New Testament and how Jesus treats the women who were, um, you know, who were prostitutes, right? And, And in that same story, she talks about, like that same sermon, she uses 
this Luke's story of Jesus being anointed by the immoral woman of the city who perfumed and kissed his feet, and then Jesus forgave her. And she, so she says, like, Jesus treats a woman in that way, so what about you? And then she talks about Revelation 3.20, which is that verse that's where Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And so she, she takes that verse about the door and Jesus by the door and the door in the story where the woman has placed her hands on the door. And she says, where is Jesus in this story? And she says, Jesus is with the woman. So again, she's bringing Jesus into this place and reminding the audience that how Jesus treated the marginalized and the outsiders uh, and the sexually promiscuous is not how we are treating them as men and women in England. And finally, um, she brings in the story of um, the woman who has the issue of blood touching the hem of Jesus' garment in Luke 8. And then she says, the cold, faint hands of the woman who's dying, falling on the threshold, groping hopelessly, have stolen in the darkness some of the virtue from Jesus' garment hem. So she puts Jesus there and blends those stories and says, the woman met Jesus in that moment. Now, that's not what this story says in the Old Testament, but she's reading the story within the whole context of Scripture, and she's reading it as a type. And she's wondering, what is the message of that horrible story in the Old Testament to today? And she says, it's a story that can be life-giving if we respond. And so she's calling, now it's the women in her audience here, but later, 20, 20 years or 30 years later, when she does this again, and she does it all the time, she's, in, she's preaching to a mixed audience. So she's saying, men and women, we've got to do something. So I find this an incredible interpretation of scripture. It's, it's like nothing you would ever read in the writings of any man, I think, uh, because she's identifying with the woman and she's seeing and hearing and feeling with this character in the story. So I find her, her work as an interpreter of scripture inspiring uh, and prophetic and timely. And every time my students read Josephine Butler's interpretation, they are very moved. And a number of people who are involved in social justice are totally inspired by this to say, like, we do need to be involved in this kind of work. And God continues to call us through scripture to do this kind of work. So I, I love Josephine Butler. I think she's, she is one of um, my historic mentors. It's, and, and she's courageous, and she's very intelligent, and she's reading scripture through her own experiences of life and finding in scripture what um, another current biblical scholar would call the whispers. She hears the whispers of the gospel. She hears God's whispers in hard stories. And... Josephine Butler even uses that expression of God whispering through scripture. And so as she hears God's whispers, she speaks them and preaches to, to, uh, to her contemporaries. So they did overturn this law, um, but that wasn't the end of the problem of prostitution. And um, what happened was after England solved this problem, Josephine Butler did a lot of traveling to Europe. And when she went to Europe, she checked out what was going on in terms of prostitution. And she soon realized that there was a difference between the age of consent in England and in Europe. Do you, do you want to talk about that for a minute? So Josephine Butler is part of advocating to change the age of consent from 12 to 13 that's still very young. In other countries in Europe, it's 16, 18, 19. And so she discovers that what's happening is children are being trafficked to mainland Europe from England. So they are brought into sex work, uh, 
in England, but then shipped over to Europe. Or they'll be kind of coerced into coming to Europe for what they are told will be domestic help work or even offers of marriage. And then when they get to Europe, they are actually put into prostitution. And when I was reading this, I was so struck by how this is something that is still happening today. And that exact narrative continues to happen. Often young women are brought into other countries by offers of jobs or marriage, and then when they get there, they are also brought into prostitution. So Josephine Butler starts working against this child prostitution in England, and she connects with a newspaper editor. William Steed, I think is name. William Steed. And together they start working on a public expose of this, and they they get undercover workers, and she herself poses as a brothel keeper and her son as someone who would um, help. I don't think he's a pimp, but she has her son also dress up, and they walk around for two weeks in London, and they spend 1,500 pounds trying to get information and in these disguises. And they have different women posing as prostitutes to get the undercover scoop. And this newspaper editor goes so far as to go undercover and actually buy a child for five pounds, a, a 12-year-old, a 13-year-old do- a girl for five pounds. And that, that story actually kind of backfires on him. And Josephine had kind of helped give him the contact but didn't know about all of the details, but this creates a huge stir in London when the story comes out in his newspaper, and flocks of people dress up as young virgins in white, and they build these floats and go to City Hall to demand that something be done about this. So there's this huge um, public outcry as a result of this work. And it's so exciting to see that that happens, but it's also really discouraging to know that all of that work is still needing to be done now. And it's also discouraging to to see what happened is that they did change the law of the legal age of consent, but they did it on the quiet because they found out that members of parliament and a number of police in France and England were involved in this uh, trafficking. And so they did arrest uh, the men involved, but they kept it quiet And because so many people were involved. So that's the dark side of it, and it continues to be the dark side of uh, trafficking, human trafficking. So even today on the news in Toronto, we heard of human trafficking and the extent in in places that we know uh, and where we live and and so as you said that the the story is not over so i think if josephine butler were alive today she would be very involved in this work she would be using social media she would be out there speaking she wrote 30 books and pamphlets she wrote uh, they still have 2500 of her letters i mean she was involved at the ground, on the ground, and writing and doing everything she could to change, you know, this dark part of life. And I think if she were here, she would call us to do the same. I think she would preach a similar sermon on Judges 19 to say, men and women in Toronto, you know, you are the men and women, you are on the inside of the house ignoring the plight of those children who are sex trafficked. What are you going to do about it? So I I find her a a prophetic voice. She speaks today. She's our sister in history. And um, I I I think we should celebrate her life. We should remember her life. We can read her biography of Catherine of Siena, which gives us an insight into her life and the life of Catherine of Siena. And she just calls us back to say, where are we in our life? 
you know, are there things we can do better in terms of our own relationship with God and in terms of how we live out our faith day to day. Thanks, Mary. Thanks for listening to That's What She Said about the Bible, a podcast by Wycliffe College. For more information and episodes, visit our website at www.wycliffecollege.ca slash podcast.